All right, let's go ahead and join in. We've got a couple of people tuning in on Facebook now, as well as those on the webinar itself. So uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us on today's webinar hosted by the Loudon Chamber. Uh, we're excited for the opportunity to continue to provide this quality content to our community in this way. Um, for a full list of our webinars, you can visit the Chamber website where these resources and more are gonna be on our new COVID-19 page. So I'll run down a couple of housekeeping items first. Um, at the end of the session, we are uh, going to have a Q&A portion. Um, if you've got a question, enter it into the question box or into the chat, we'll be monitoring both. Um, if you're tuning in on Facebook Live and you have a question, go ahead and just put it in the comments and we will also be monitoring that. So we'll try to get to as many questions as we can this morning. Um, Go ahead and provide your name and your business in the chat so that we can connect with you. That will help Ken and Josh to better uh, answer your questions going forward. And then um, in the chat box, there will be some more resources from the chamber as well as Boulder Crest Retreat just to give you some more uh, learning material. So thanks again for tuning in. We're gonna get started now. Um, we're speaking today with uh, Ken Falk and Josh Goldberg of Boulder Crest Retreat and Boulder Crest Institute. So Ken and Josh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and what you do? Yep, yeah, I'm Ken uh, Falk. I, I'm the chairman here at Boulder Crest Retreat. Uh, my background is I spent 21 years in the Navy. I'm a Virginian. I grew up down in Alexandria, Virginia, and spent 21 years in the Navy as a bomb disposal guy and um, got out of the Navy, started my own small business. I sold that business um, back in 2008. I ran it for a few more years and left in 2010 and really since then since about 2010 we've been working on what we do here at boulder crest retreat which we'll share more of uh of today and i live in loudon county um, out on the far western side in, in bluemont Hi, and i'm josh goldberg so boulder crest has uh, three kind of components to it we have boulder crest arizona which is a 130 acre facility where we run programs for combat veterans and their families and first responders primarily with psychological health challenges, PTSD, anxiety, depression, suicidality. And we have Boulder Crest, Virginia, which is on 37 acres here in Loudoun. And then we've got the Boulder Crest Institute. And really what the Institute's designed to do is to focus more externally on how do we translate what we're learning in our programs to the outside world. And uh, we were having a bit of a preamble conversation about you know, one of the things I think to be a sustained and effective nonprofit requires the recognition that being a nonprofit is just a tax status. It doesn't suggest how you should do things. And if you don't run your nonprofit like a business, then you likely will have some challenges, especially in moments like we're in now. And so my background is I actually spent the first 11 years of my professional life working uh, in big tobacco at a company called British American Tobacco in London and New Zealand, and then uh, big oil, which is at ExxonMobil in Dallas at the headquarters for six years. Um, and so my own personal journey obviously doesn't make a lot of sense to people as far as how I would do that and then get to the world of veterans. Um, but the, the sort of long story short is I had an existential crisis as to what I was doing with my life, um, started to struggle greatly, uh, had an inclination to serve others uh, and started to do that. And it turned out that the people I was serving were, were veterans. Um, and they promptly told me that I wasn't allowed to help them until I helped myself and they helped me do that. And that's how I kind of transitioned from being a very corporate person uh, to getting to live in, in the beautiful town of Bluemont and getting to do this work. Excellent. Thank you both. The only other thing, I, <laughs> only other thing I'd add is um, uh, the title of this presentation is Struggle Well. Josh and I uh, had been asked a lot uh, over the last five or six years, did they think what we were doing with veterans and first responders, would it translate into a broader uh, civilian community? We thought so. We still think so very much. And uh, a year and a half ago now, we wrote a book called Struggle Well, Thriving in the Aftermath of Trauma. We just co-authored that book. Um, so uh, it shares our philosophy of what we're gonna share with you today. And it also shares some of our, some of our personal stories are kind of woven through the book. So uh, we're not here to sell you books by any means. Matter of fact, if you want one for free, stop by and, and see us and we'll, we'll give you one. But, uh, but I want you to understand that what we're trying to do is really translate this to a broader community than just combat veterans because trauma is trauma in, in, in most of our eyes so let's get going absolutely so i'll um if you enjoy the presentation and you want to get the book i'll go ahead and put a link to the um 
to Amazon. So you can go ahead and put that in your cart today. So thank you all so much for being here. Go ahead and take it away. Uh, you know, and I think one of the things when we talk about this subject uh, of well-being or mental health, however you want to contextualize it, is, is people tend to think of it in binary terms, that either you have it or you don't, and that there are certain factors and other things that cause certain people to have mental health issues and not. And I think one of the things that's very true, and, and this COVID-19 circumstance indicates that, is that we're all susceptible to external shocks to our system that cause us to struggle. And, and that struggle manifests in different ways and people have different ways of calling it different things. So struggle, adversity, challenge, trauma. The, the point is that one of the core beliefs we have in life is that we will all encounter struggle in our life. That's why we call it struggle well. That the only question is what do you do to navigate those challenges and struggles in a way that allows you to be productive and constructive and not get stuck in, in, in into a place where you do end up in a mental health system but that all of us struggle in some form or fashion and we all operate not in a binary fashion, but on a continuum. Uh, at the core of what we've done at the retreat, uh, is, uh, the retreats rather, is, is to work on something called, the science is something called post-traumatic growth. And post-traumatic growth suggests that struggle is both inevitable in our lives and also has value. And there's lots of amazing stories of, of people and, and communities that have experienced that Two of our favorites are, are a book by Viktor Frankl, who was a concentration camp survivor, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. The other are the prisoners of war at the Hanoi Hilton, um, who returned home uh, with only a 4%, 4% PTSD rate and really came home uh, better off than they were before they went. And what we've worked on at our programs is how do you operationalize a roadmap that allows people to struggle well and to transform struggle into strength and growth? And what I want to show you on the screen now is what that roadmap looks like. And there are five components to it, and it's built on an environment of trust and connection. So one of the reasons why, of course, it's, it's very effective to have these beautiful places we do is that when people come, they feel physically safe, and the, our staff are primarily veterans. So if you're dealing with other veterans, you have that innate sense of trust and connection. So they're safe physically, emotionally, spiritually, and so forth. But a core aspect of any kind of effort to learn how to struggle well is that it's built on a sense of trust and connection for yourself and other people. And then you walk through these five phases, which I'll touch on very briefly. And it's important to say that, you know, this isn't like if I graduate from doing these five things, life is great, life is easy, and I've, 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 I've cured myself of any issues related to life. This is an ongoing and lifelong journey of growth and, and healing and discovery and learning. So these five phases are education, which is really learning about struggle. It's learning about uh, post-traumatic growth and learning about the opportunities inherent to struggle. And it's understanding the ways in which that affects us. And this would include things like obviously reading a book like Struggle Well, looking at stories like at the Hanoi Hilton and Viktor Frankl, but it's all about shaping a mental mindset of what do you believe about life and what do you believe about struggle. So if we think about that, that's educating our mind. The issue that most of us have is that it doesn't really matter what we know when, when we're encountering a situation that causes our emotions to overwhelm us or to flex. So I could know, for example, I'm an uncle. I don't have any kids, but I'm an uncle. I can know, because I work with child psychiatrists a lot, what best practice parenting looks like. But when my niece is throwing a tantrum in the middle of a store, all of that stuff is very easily thrown out the window as I start to get more and more frustrated and angry with her behavior. And the idea is that if you just educate your mind without educating your heart, you haven't really accomplished anything. And that topic of regulation, how do we navigate ups and downs in a way that allows us to manage and regulate our emotions is what we're gonna focus on in detail. The third part of that is disclosure. And this is having a small group of people in your life who you can talk about really difficult things with. That could be difficult things that happened to you or difficult things that you did to other people. And this is where subjects like guilt and shame, and if anyone knows Brene Brown's work, she talks a lot about these subjects, is the idea of finding people in your life who you can talk to about the things that you don't want to talk to most people about. Because we do know that you are only as stuck as your secrets. You do all of that so you can build a story of your life that is forward-looking and is positive and is fulfilling. And it's filled with meaning and it's filled with purpose. And ultimately it's filled with service because we know that life can't be lived for ourselves alone. It must be lived for a cause greater than our, than, than our own. And I, I speak personally as a civilian without any military background, is that notion of being driven to serve other people is certainly, uh, for obvious reasons, the greatest lesson I've taken from this community 
But a core part that underpins all of that is you can't serve other people unless you can effectively serve yourself. And one of the challenges we've seen in the mental health system is that you have a lot of what are called wounded healers, which are people who've been through their own trauma and that's led them to wanna to help other people with their trauma. But if you're not successfully, uh, kind of if you haven't successfully addressed your own issues, then what ends up happening is that hurt people hurt other people, is that you get diminishing returns. And there's a quote from St. Augustine uh, where he said, first fill yourself and then you may serve others. So these are the five phases. And this is what we, we write the book all about. This is the nature of all of the programs we run. Um, we're looking to launch some online training focused on struggle well, but mining and exploring each of these five areas is what will allow you to struggle well. So let's take a deep dive into what seems to be, I think, a priority A, not just for this call, but for people right now. Because obviously, for lots of reasons, people are struggling. They're struggling financially. They're struggling physically. They're struggling emotionally. They're struggling spiritually. Uh, people are obviously losing folks they're close with. I personally have a good friend in a in a medically induced coma in Miami who's 46 years old with coronavirus. So we all have our stories of how this is affecting us, notwithstanding people trying to work from home, teach their kids, and not choke each other, right? So there's a lot going on in terms of stress that's taking place. This is what we believe. We believe that life is filled with ups and downs. Life is not a flat line that you get knocked off. Life is a series of ups and downs. And so if you think about this idea, it's like I'm born and that's seemingly a good moment, right? And then I break my arm when I'm four years old and I go back down. And then when I'm 10, I get my first bike and I'm riding around and having a great time. And then I get caught because I stole some baseball cards and, and then I get married and then I get divorced. And so you have these ups and downs in this natural way, natural rhythm of life. And the question is, are you going to live life or is life going to live you? And this model of living with those red bumpers on either side essentially are the equivalent of a bowling alley where you put those bumpers into the gutters to prevent the ball from not hitting pins. Is if in life you want to be able to respond rather than react, you want to be able to be the person, parent, and partner that you want to be the majority of the time, you need two things. You need a support network and mentors. You are the average of the three to five people you spend the most time with. You're the average of the three to five people you spend the most time with. And those people will either lift you up or they will bring you down. And, and ultimately, in this world of being able to struggle well and respond to life, you would be surrounded by people who make you a better version of yourself, who hold you accountable, who have what you want in terms of being principled people. And maybe if you want to be an entrepreneur and be great at that, you'd obviously have people who've been successful entrepreneurs. If you're someone who's of faith, then you would want someone in your three to five who is of faith. You want people who can guide and support and mentor you, not so much by giving you advice, but simply by the example they show you. The second is you would have wellness practices. And Ken's going to talk in more detail about how we chunk up wellness practices into a triangle. But these are practices that essentially let air out of the tires and allow you to create calm and to deal with life. The truth for most people is that this is not how we live our lives. This is how we live our lives. And as I said, the difference is either you live life or life lives you. And in this world, life is living you. Two years ago, I saw research that suggested that 55% of people in this country felt overwhelmed by stress, which means the vast majority of people in this country are one bad barista away from essentially losing their mind, right? Because it's just like, I can't take any more stuff and still function as, a, as an adult. And so what happens in this world is that you ride these waves up and down like a roller coaster and in seeking balance, which is in the middle of those green lines, we often engage in negative practices that are far more available and in some respects socially acceptable than maybe going to yoga class or meditate. The two things that exacerbate this way of life, and in this way of life, what you find happening is, is an incident occurs, you disproportionately react to that incident, and then you judge yourself and other people judge you and you tend to isolate and it starts to wear on you. Uh, I recently, I was in the grocery store three days ago. I went to buy some salad dressing, got a salad dressing, it's fantastic. And I, I hit two bottles together in my left hand and dressing, the bottle broke and I got dressing everywhere. And it's one of those moments where if I'm living in the green, which thankfully I was, I stayed there, I laughed. I was able to flag down someone to help me. We used like four, pieces of paper towel as little bit as possible and a mop and we cleaned it up together. We laughed we, and then we, we socially distanced and laughed and then we left. But if I was on a red, if I was living in the red 
the possible response is either I slam down the other dressing, I run out of the store in a huff, right? There's some way of acting or I take it out on other people because side note, my jeans were covered in salad dressing. So this is what differentiates these two worlds is how do we handle this stuff that's going to happen in our lives? The two things that exacerbate this are bad influencers. So the wrong kind of people who, who influence us to do the wrong kinds of things. And this is the idea that misery loves company. When I struggled deeply and I went through a divorce and my mom's brain had tumor in her, in her brain, all of these things happen all at the same time. And I found myself with an accumulation of friends who were engaged in lots of, of dodgy, not illegal, but just dodgy behavior. And part of the reason why it's so toxic to have bad influencers as close friends is you can always justify yourself by saying at least I'm not the worst of the bunch, right? At least I didn't do what that guy did. And so those kinds of people are toxic and we have to be very mindful and acutely aware of who we have in our lives. And part of that's like an inventory of who, who are the three to five people I spend the most time with. The other part of that are unhealthy habits. And these are things like drugs and alcohol and violence, and sex, all of these sorts of things where we're trying to essentially distract ourselves from what we're experiencing. And there are things we do to create highs, like maybe go drive 150 miles an hour down the road, and things we do to bring ourselves down when we feel anxious, we feel high, which would be like alcohol. And the challenge in this world is in the very high highs of that red is where you would get when the clinical world would call it anxiety. That's what anxiety looks like. It's when you're living and you feel like you're on edge. And then way down low is depression. And as Ken likes to say, if you can't self-regulate, you'll often self-medicate. Here's what's striking about the research I pulled two days ago. What is very clear is that most people in this country are resorting to unhealthy habits in the wake of COVID-19. Nationwide alcohol sales are up 55% and online sales are up 243%. Weed sales, especially where marijuana is legal, have gone through the roof. Corn consumption is up 6.4%. People are moving less and eating more. So we're talking a drop in activity on fitness trackers at, at a pretty large number of 39% in a week. So people are sitting at home, drinking alcohol, smoking weed, watching stuff they probably shouldn't be watching, and, and watching probably Netflix and not doing anything constructive. And the result, which is the last one, is that anxiety levels are through the roof. Through the roof, right, 49%. And I would suggest it's probably even higher. And this is what I meant earlier when I said, I think that people have often had this notion that somehow there are folks susceptible to mental health challenges and struggle and others who aren't. And the thing is, we're human, we're all susceptible. And right now is a very challenging moment. So those are the two worlds. And ultimately, obviously what we teach here is how do you go from red to green? How do you go from reacting in life to responding in life? And, and in part, like I said, that's about the people you surround yourselves with. But the other part, which is what we wanna talk about today is the wellness practices you can put in place in your life that are effective at doing this. Great. Well, thanks, Josh. So uh, we're going to transition right from that into this wellness triangle and how do we create this life that kind of keeps us in that green sine wave that, that Josh uh, mentioned. So imagine the, this triangle and, and at the top of the triangle and is, is our mind at the bottom where you see the guy lifting weights is our is our body, is our fitness. On the right side is our financial wellness. And in the center of it is this kind of spiritual wellness. What is it inside of me that drives me to do something for somebody other than myself? Because if you analyze this triangle, uh, really what's on the outside of the triangle is our ego. How smart are we? How fit are we? How good looking are we? How much money do we have? But even though the triangle geometrically is the strongest shape we know, at some point in time, if it starts to get flattened on the sides, it'll collapse if nothing's in there. And you see this globally in places where, around the world where there's not a lot of wisdom and there's not a lot of fitness and there's not a lot of money. Let's say maybe a place like Haiti that gets devastated by a hurricane and floods and whatever else happens. But the people there are very spiritual, very religious, and they tend to get through these things because they're not worried about what's on the outside of this, this egotistical shell. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong or right. I'm just saying that to have a life of wellness, you've got to have all four of them. The sharper the points on those triangles, the better. The, the, the more inflation in that spirituality and that ball, uh, the better. So 
what I want to do is, is kind of walk you through a little bit of, of what it means and how we, how we take an inventory here um, at Boulder Crest Retreat and how I think it translates to you and for you to take a personal inventory kind of as we're talking, uh, kind of talking through what this triangle really looks like in practice. Um, so let's talk a little bit about me mental wellness, uh, what happens in our mind. So first and foremost, the mind is, is probably the most misunderstood or, or, or not understood, if you will, organ in the body. The, the brain, the, the, the best neurologists in the world know a lot about the brain, but don't know enough about the brain. They don't know everything about the brain. And every day, somebody is learning something new. But the truth is, is our engine. It's what drives the, 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 the actions that our body uh, takes, that, that we as humans take. And in that mind, the, the, the goal in life should be to get it better and better and stronger and stronger as you go on, right? We want to increase the wisdom, the ability to make great decisions and, and tough decisions when, they're, when they do. But how do we focus on what, what that looks like and, and, and what do we do to make it stronger? So in the mental wellness practices, we do a lot of things. Uh, many, many studies that occur that, that kind of led us to this belief. But number one and foremost is gratitude. What, in fact, are you grateful for today? Josh and I, we have an honorary board of directors. We have a board of directors at Boulder Crest Retreat. And we have an honorary board, which are some pretty impressive folks. You can look them up on our website. But one of them is Charlie Plum, who's a retired Navy captain who was shot down on his 74th mission over Vietnam and spent 2,103 days. That's almost six years to the day in prison camps and in isolation. And we did a um, podcast with, with uh, Charlie the other day, and uh, we were talking about toilet paper and not having toilet paper for six years. And, you know, it's like these small things of gratitude that just come, come to you naturally, that it doesn't have to be anything huge, but what am I doing? And we have a couple exercises where we can do things with your family. Like maybe families will have a gratitude board on their refrigerator. And every morning, you know, you wake up and you kind of put, what am I grateful for today? And it's amazing. Even little children, four or five, six years old, what, what they'll tell you that they're grateful for um, in a day. It might be their cereal, but they're grateful for something. Uh, we do a lot of journaling. Uh, we have a win for the day. What, you know, what, what was your win at the end of the day? Every day we do an inventory. What was it for you that really made the day a great, a great day uh, or, 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 or gave you that one thing that kept you going through the day? Uh, music uh, is amazing. Our brains, we remember songs better than anything else in the world, the lyrics to songs. So there's these, these, these songs that bring back great memories that we can play and really bring us to a great place when you're trying to regulate. Uh, the connection with your three to five, which we can't um, underemphasize. <clears throat> I think that uh, we call it pruning, um, getting people out of your life that, that, that just don't belong there. And, and these are choices we have as humans. And those people may be family members too, and it's hard, I know. Uh, I've done it personally. I mean, you just have to sometimes step away because toxicity is what brings us down. And at the end of the day, our health has got to be first because we can't help anybody including our family members if we're not strong. Breathing, we have a technique called the four, seven, eight. You take a breath in for four seconds, you hold it for seven, and you exhale for eight. Doing that two or three times is amazing how fast that'll calm the nerves. Remember that our bodies and our brains and our heart and our lungs require good uh, oxygen. And, and, and getting that oxygen in fully and taking those deep breaths will really help you resolve. Meditation, there's a lot of different types of meditation. We do guided meditation. We do mindfulness space. We do transcendental meditation. Some people will do, refer to it in prayer here. What can you do to bring yourself back to yourself? That's really important, I think, every day. Um, reading. Reading is a great way to increase your wisdom. It's a great way to learn about things that are happening uh, and reading from the fact. I think today, more than ever, it's a great time. We told uh, somebody a couple weeks ago in, in a podcast, it's a great time to take a social media and news diet. And uh, even if you're gaining a few pounds and, and not walking and eating a little bit too much during the time, uh, I think this is one diet we can all afford to take. 
There's a lot of bad news out there, social media. It's a great time to clean your, your friends list up and get the friends pruned out of there that, that, that just post this negativity. It's just nothing good comes out of that because the more negativity you're exposed to, the more negative you're gonna become. Um, so this is really important, I think, now. And then this routine and schedule, not to get off of it. I know it's hard to work from home. My first company I started in my garage and, 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 and I remember being out there and working and my wife would say, hey, can you come hang a picture? And I'd say, well, I'm, I'm kind of at work, but I wasn't at work, I was at home. So I understand this, but building that schedule and agreeing to it with your partners, with your folks, your roommates, whatever it might be, I think is really important to keep a routine and schedule during these times. And then sleep. Sleep is probably one of the most important things. Scientists say we should sleep for eight hours a night. I know not, not all of us do. I can get by on about six and a half or seven, but eight hours of sleep is what scientists believe that we need to be completely recharged. Your body doesn't store sleep. You can't have six one night and 10 the next and make up for it. It just doesn't work that way. So every night you need to sleep. And, and, and this is where that self-medicating doesn't do any good. And by the way, we're, we're not opposed to having a glass of wine or a bourbon or any of that, but what we don't want you to do is drink or smoke weed until you do fall asleep because nothing good comes out of that. Good REM sleep is really healthy for you and, and it really keeps you recharged for what the next day is. And I just, um, to, to emphasize a few of Ken's points, I think one is, so we sat down, we interviewed Charlie Plum on Wednesday, we released the podcast on Thursday, which is available on any podcast uh, system you might use. And part of what we talked to Charlie about is like, okay, you spent six years more or less in isolation deprived of lots of creature comforts. And most importantly, you had no idea when you were gonna get out or if you were gonna get out. And so you start to talk to Charlie and say, okay, you're in an eight by eight cell, what did you learn? And, and the first thing he says that he learned is that the prison cell wasn't eight by eight feet, it was eight inches in his mind. And that ultimately he learned that he had to befriend his own mind to be the guardian of his own mind and to be really thoughtful about the, the thoughts he was having and the things he was ingesting and affecting. And, and I like to call this, and I think it's a, someone else said it first, is being the guardian of your own mind. And, you know, there are people, and I have friends who can't stand watching the government press conferences every day. And I'm like, stop watching the government press conferences every day. You're not in North Vietnam. You're not being tortured by anybody else. You're torturing yourself. So the point is, if we know what we need to do as it relates to taking care of washing our hands and so forth, then don't constantly be checking the news to find that. The, the second thing is, as a reminder, is as Mr. Rogers always told kids, when stuff goes down, look for the helper. There are always helpers, and there are amazing stories all across the world of people doing amazing things right now, and, and that's volunteers going to New York to help out, Oregon sent ventilators, people, ambulance drivers going up there, um, people adopting elderly in England to be able to, to connect with them and talk to them when they're isolated in these, in these places being sick. There's a lot of good happening in the world. And that's when Ken says, look at what you're doing on social media is if you're following a bunch of stuff that's toxic and hateful, who's, who's causing the problem? Is it those sites or is it you're following those sites? So just being really diligent and thoughtful. And the second thing I want to stress is, you know, when we think about well-being and if somebody has the notion of like going on some lofty meditation retreat or having to go to yoga class, it's like this stuff does not require, you could do this in a prison cell. That's the bottom line test for all of this stuff is this is all stuff you can do right now very easily. And things like the 478 can be done in 30 seconds or 20 seconds. So part of what we're, we're as we think about COVID-19, it's like, how do you get people the opportunity to, to, to do things that are very practical and applicable? And that's what we work on here. But the truth is we've tested everything that relates to well-being at Boulder Crest, and we know that it works. So if it works here, especially with people who are really severely struggling, and even in the absence of COVID-19, we can assure you it will work there, wherever you are, whatever you're up to in your life. So then we focus, you know, back on the, on the physical wellness side of, of our lives. And what does that mean to us? It means flexibility, strength, good diet, nutrition, and, uh, and hydration. Those are the things that we look at when we talk about our, our, our body. So here's some of the things that we think you can do to kind of get out. Um, I know the getting outside uh, part's a little bit tough. I, I drove up to the top of the mountain yesterday and I saw that the uh, Appalachian Trail parking area is blocked off. So, um, but there are places to get out and walk. I live on a gravel road, ride my bike down here to the office in the morning. Uh, but to do something to walk and stretch daily. Um, 
uh, the gyms are all closed, so I know it's a little bit problematic, but there's a lot of things you can do. You can push ups and sit ups, and a lot of exercises that you can do that don't require you go into a gym. Uh, don't overeat. I found myself a little bit last week, kind of, I went through a whole jar of peanut butter, which I never normally would do, but uh, I think it's important to, to make sure during this time that we don't overeat. You know, make a plan, stick with the plan, minimize the junk food, the energy drinks, uh, the alcohol consumption. Uh, do do that and, and, and bring your family into a cooking, uh, uh, you know, come up with different recipes. There's some great things that come up online every single day and find some things where you can gather around your family and, and cook. Don't ever forget your water. I mean, our bodies rely on hydration, eight to 10 glasses of water per day. Uh, I'm not a doctor, but I, but I played one on TV once. Uh, wash your hands. I mean, I, I think if there's one thing we know about this is that we can spread this COVID-19 uh, e easily and, and washing our hands is very, very important. Um, and then once they're washed and even before they're washed, avoid touching your face and biting your nails and all the things you might be doing is, is, is all coming up. And, 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 and most importantly, try to avoid the crowds right now. I think that's really physically a good thing to do. We don't call it social distancing as much as we believe in this kind of physical distancing. Staying six feet away from people is really important because socially, you know, who would have thought, or I wouldn't have thought almost 50 years ago watching the Jetsons on TV on Saturday morning that I'd ever be able to sit here in front of a computer and, and actually talk uh, and see other people. So uh, socially, I think we can stay connected, but physically, I think it's really important right now not to. And I think the, um, we talked a little bit about it when I talked about the kind of phases of struggling well is, is you know, and, and this is the same thing Charlie says, which is, you know, we each can make a choice in this experience of COVID-19 for however long it lasts, is what this experience is going to be like. And if you think about in 10 or 20 years, and maybe your grandkids are going to ask you about it someday and say, you know, what was that whole thing? Is, is what did you do with that experience? Because right now, what is true is life has slowed down dramatically. Uh, the number of distractions has slowed down dramatically. The pace of life has slowed down. And the opportunity is to, to in some ways, do a really deep introspection and reflection about the, the life you're living and the choices you're making. And, you know, my brother's got young kids and, and one day a week, the kids get to decide what's for dinner. Now, granted, it's usually French fries. Um, they get made. But the point is, how do you build routines and create memories the same way you would if you were on a vacation? It's just that the point of all of this in life, and this is what the POWs will tell you, is it's all about your perspective. And so if you view this as some miserable time that you just hope is going to end, and I'm not understating the, the, the burdens that are placed, to, especially on small businesses. I mean, my brother's laying off 10 people today. These are hard choices that people are having to make. But as a broad context, if you view this as a miserable time you just want to end, or you view this as an opportunity to relook at life and to really make some good choices and build some new habits and new routines for you, for the people you care about, I think that's the choice people have to make, is which way are you going to go? And if you choose an attitude of gratitude, and reflection, you're going to go one way. And if you choose an attitude that's negative and toxic and, 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 and drinking and eating bad food and all the rest of it, that's, that's your choice. But there is good reason to be had, given that we're not supposed to go to the grocery store a lot, that like meal planning is something that could be implemented and cooking together is something that can be implemented. So I think all of those things need to be considered. And obviously, where possible, support your local businesses and restaurants who are obviously trying to stay uh, around. Uh, let's talk about financial wellness next, the, the third kind of corner of this triangle. Uh, and my dad used to say pretty simply, uh, don't spend more than you make. And, and, you know, we as Americans tend to spend more than we make. And, uh, you know, nice cars, nice houses, I think, uh, you know, per capita, if you look at debt to income ratios, they're pretty significant uh, in our country. And that's really, you know, stressful and, and, and running your businesses that way. I mean, it's, it's, you know, not all businesses are cash rich. So you get to a situation where you haven't put some money away for these rainy days, it's very difficult. Um, nothing's worse than your air conditioner breaking out and you have to go take out a second mortgage or a loan to replace your, your air conditioner because we've over, uh, you know, overspent. So financial wellness is really, really important. And I think as Josh mentioned, you know, you've got this time now this is a great time. I think, you know, for me, it's a great time to sit back and say, oh, now I finally got an hour or two to breathe and to 
think about what we can innovate, what's the next level of innovation, what does this company, Boulder Crest Retreat Foundation, look like on the other side of COVID-19. Uh, you know, we're trying to think of all these things now, and it's really given us a chance, because the truth is, just like in any small business, you know, it's like painting an airplane when it's flying, and that's the same thing we have here at Boulder Crest, is that every day we, we have guests here, and, and we, every day we're delivering a program, and we never have time to kind of go, ah, let's slow down for a minute, let's, you know, try to figure out what we can do to be a better organization, and now this has really given us that, that kind of time to do it. Um, including the you know payday protection loans and all the things that are coming out from the small business administration now's a great time to kind of focus on uh financial wellness and these are some of the things that you can do and i think first and foremost uh you know most of us don't have a, a budget we don't really understand what we spend every month but you know maybe it's time to sit down and kind of create that to really take a look at how much your bills are and to fully understand that uh it's a terrible time to do daily stock market checks uh and your 401k. Remember, your stock market and 401k is cyclical, just like your life. And, you know, the, the goal is that by the time you get to retirement, all this money is, 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 is ready to harvest. But, but checking it every day and worrying and then selling things when the market's down, and, you know, that's when the real loss has become a problem. But uh, don't talk to me. Talk to a financial advisor and, and make sure you fully understand that, what that plan is going to be. Um, and don't panic. It's, it, there's no reason to panic right now. This is, this is something this country will bounce back from, just like we bounce back from others. It's not the last traumatic event that's going to occur here. We, most of us probably that are listening to the podcast live through 9-11. Some of us live through um, even worse uh, scenarios and situations than that. But it's really important, I think, now not to, not to panic and, and be, the, be the strength in the, of, the, of the community that you need to be. Uh, plan for the next several months. And, and, and I think most importantly, in the world of financial wellness, this last bullet on this slide is so important. Material solutions don't solve our non-material solutions. And this is that whole concept of like retail therapy. I want to feel better for myself. I go buy a new car. Then I come home and I realize, you know, crap, I, I got to make this car payment, $400, $500 a month or whatever, whatever that might be. These material solutions don't solve happiness. Don't create happiness. Be careful trying to, to balance that as you spend your, your money and take care of your family. And um, I have to acknowledge that Exxon typos got you in real trouble, like sent to countries you didn't want to go to. So that last bullet should say material pro solutions do not and cannot solve spiritual problems is, is what uh, that bullet should have said, which is what Ken explained. Um, but if you're reading it, um, that's, that's the point of that, right? Is that while you have basic needs and other kinds of needs is that there is no cre increase in happiness between people who make $75,000 a year up to $2 million a year because you just get more expensive habits. And um, I certainly think, you know, in my life, I was, I was married for four years and I married someone who's very wealthy as in uh, wealthy with a B. And, and you start to realize that, you know, oftentimes lots and lots of money can create more and can cover up more problems. So you get a, a rug with a lot of stuff pushed under it because money can paper over things for some period of time. But I think the, the biggest lesson, and, and I come back again, and you can tell I'm, I'm quite a fan of the story, is you know, these guys at the Hanoi Hilton were from the standpoint of, of life in the military, they were king of the skies. I mean, they were flying these airplanes and were, were literally kings as fighter pilots. And they became scum of the earth in a, in a heartbeat. In like three seconds, they were on the ground getting beaten up. And what they found and what they realized was that status, that money, that power, it didn't mean anything. And what they were forced to do as their life became stripped down, right, with, with a fake name and, and a, and a loincloth was what actually matters in life. And, and what matters in life are really five things. It's, it's uh, new possibilities, it's a sense of hope for the future, deeper relationships, the notion that, that the great life's built on great relationships, it's personal strength, it's an understanding and appreciation for our own capabilities, it's an appreciation for life, a sense of gratitude, and it's spiritual and existential change, a sense of connection to a cause greater than our own. That's what matters. I mean, ultimately, when you look at people who've lived successful lives, those are the things they're measured on. And, and, and this isn't to say that you know, financial wellness isn't a, per se a goal. It's just to say you have to be put into context of really what actually matters when it comes to living a life worth living. Now let's kind of focus on that spiritual side. Remember, in an ideal situation, the triangle is as sharp as it can be on the end on these points. Uh, and in the center of this circle, our, our spirit is really touching three sides. 
And just as a reminder, we measure spirituality in three ways. Our character. Are we the person that we say we are? Our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions aligned, or what we would refer to as living a congruent lifestyle. Um, number two, are we um, deepening in our relationships with that three to five? Is our family type? What are our relationships and what is the value of those relationships and, and how healthy are those relationships? And then the third thing is what are we doing for others? Even in this time, you know, I mean, it's, I, 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 our staff here and in Arizona, I'm so proud of them because, you know, we didn't have a lot to do because we don't have any guests right now. So they went out and did a food drive and we helped Mobile Hope here in Loudoun County and we filled two food banks worth of food out in Arizona um, where we can do. So what is it that you're doing for somebody else? And, it's, and it doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to go out today and start a nonprofit, but there's things that you can do. Every, even in this county, the richest county in the United States, there's, there's things you can do to help people that aren't as, uh, as well off as maybe, maybe you might be. So um, that's what we define as spirituality. And these are kind of really the things that, that we believe you can do during these times, staying connected with the technology, the Zoom, and FaceTime, and all the uh, Skype, whatever it is that you do, and from all over the, uh, the world, friends that you may have met. And just checking in with, with friends. I checked in last night with a, a mentor of mine who's in his 80s and uh, a, a business mentor of mine, and, and just checked in to see how he was doing last night. And I think it's just really good to be able to to, to, to do, do something for somebody else. Um, giving back, you know, right now, the children, the elderly, uh, people that are in the hospital, whose family members are in the hospital, poverty um, sit situations, they only get worse during these times, especially as people are losing their jobs. What can you do to help them? It doesn't have to be financial in, in sense, it may just be a sitting and listening uh, and, and, and connecting with somebody. Uh, maybe checking through your family memories, your photos, and making some photo albums and trying to spend the time now with the family that's in your house to, to really get closer to them. And I'm sure by the end of the day, uh, I don't have any young children anymore. I have four grandchildren. And quite frankly, it's probably the worst part of this whole thing for me is that I haven't been able to have them in my house because we normally have them a lot. But the truth is, um, I know by the end of the day, sometimes three or four kids in the house can really make you feel uh, you know, stressed out. So, you know, take the time and try to create these memories and, and, and have that kind of cow gone moment at the end of the day and, and when you put them to bed and, and take that quality time for yourself. Uh, this is a great um, inventory tool. It's called the VIA Strength Assessment. You can do this online, it's free. Uh, it takes an inventory of your character and I think understanding who you are and really is really important because that leads to the next part is now I understand my character. Am I really living this congruent life or am I, am I thinking and saying things differently than what I'm actually doing? And, you know, from a leadership perspective, none of us like to work with those leaders that will kind of say as I, as I do or say as I say or do as I say, don't, don't, uh, do, as do. don't do as I do. Um, those aren't the best leaders to work for. You know, you want to be congruent. You want to be doing the things that, that, that you really believe in, I think. At, the, at these times, it gives us this great opportunity to, to do this internal inventory um, and to inflate that spirituality ball in the center of our triangle as much as we can. So let's real quick um, take a look at this slide. On one side is this wellness triangle. It's just a mess, which we could imagine is this kind of COVID-19, or maybe it's your everyday life that your triangle just hasn't come together. But take... Take the second, as I walk you through this real quick, and on a scale of one to five, measure yourself. Measure yourself on a one being the lowest and a five being the highest. So in our mind, I can't concentrate on anything. I'm not able to self-regulate. I'm not doing anything productive. Maybe I'm a one. On the other hand, on a five, I'm calm. I'm actively learning. I'm motivated. I'm setting and accomplishing the goals that I've set in my life. That might be a five. And then maybe you're somewhere in between. Maybe you're two, three, four. And then a body, I can't sleep at night, I can't walk up the stairs without getting out of breath. You know, that's a one or a five, I'm in the gym five times a week, I'm eating healthy, I'm on a regular routine, I feel fit, I feel good about myself, that might be a five. And somewhere in between, you might be a two, three, or four. And a one, maybe you're suffering from an injury or a hip replacement or knee, knee replacement. I mean, something could be going on in your body that's affecting you in other ways. 
uh, financially. Maybe you know, you're homeless, you're broke, you can't make ends meet, you can't cover your current expenses and responsibilities. You might be down at a one. Otherwise, you're in a five. You know, we believe you should have at least three to four months of your, your cash flow saved in a plan, something going on for your future, your 401k or something. This gives us some level of savings. If you're making $1,000 a week, is $4,000 a month, you should probably have a savings account of $16,000, $20,000 so that when these crises come up, you've got something to lean back on. And I know it's hard, trust me. I was in the Navy for 21 years. I know what it's like living from payday to payday, but I also know that you can plan for, for your future and put some of that away because we spend a lot of money and no disrespect to Starbucks, they're a great partner of ours, but you know, if you're buying five or six cups of coffee a week, I mean, just, you know, 20 bucks that, that you could be putting into the savings accounts, a hundred bucks a month. So, you know, money adds up pretty quickly if you save it. And I think that that's our message. Uh, spiritually, maybe you're a one, if you're completely disconnected, you don't believe in anything other than yourself. You have no clue why you're even here. You know, you're down on your, on your luck. I mean, all those kind of things that, that allow us not to be connected to ourselves. Spiritually, on a five, you know, you're living a life of service. You know why you're here. You understand that there's something bigger than ourselves and, and you're trying to make the best of that with, with, the, with the community. And again, somewhere in between your two, three or a four. Because once we do, let me go ahead, Josh. Once we do uh, this, this kind of inventory of our, our wellness, and we measure these areas, then really what it does is how do we define success? And we define success simply a Boulder Crest retreat that you do today better than you did yesterday. This isn't about five years, 20 years down the road. None of us, none of us a year ago would have thought we were at where we are today. So to set these long-term goals in your life, it's very, very difficult to achieve them. So we believe it's kind of one day at a time, but set some goals, one year, two years, maybe out three years, but be careful in getting out too far because every day something's gonna change. And the success is really doing better today than, than, than you did yesterday. And really what we want you to do is, now that you know your inventory, what your goals are, if you're a one, how do I get to a five? Because as Earl Nightingale said, people with goals succeed because they know where they're going. And we're not living this proverbial life of the t kind of the tail wagging the dog. We're in charge. And we, we succeed because we've set these goals and every day we get up and we work on them. And that's what's really important. And, and, and working on those goals should be focused on your wellness triangle. What am I doing for my mind, my body, my finances, and spiritually? If I'm a one, two, three, or four, am I working towards being a five? Uh, and that's really what, what we believe life's all about. And it puts you back into a, a livable sine wave. Yeah, and the bottom line, and then we'll turn it over to Ashley, is um, if you're struggling in the midst of all this, you're a perfectly normal human being, right? And, and everybody in some way, shape, or form is taking a toll on uh, the second thing is, um, while it may seem like, you know, this is a lot of stuff and it's all new, it's like the whole point of that success definition is pick one thing, right? Pick a gratitude exercise, pick a win for the day, pick a walk every day, do one thing differently each day and then add a second thing and add a third thing and figure it out and test what works for you and what makes you, you best able to be the person, the parent and the partner you want to be. And, 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 and the point is that this stuff takes a little bit more diligence because ironically, the, the temptations, the unhealthy stuff is much easier to access than this stuff. But the point is like we spend all of our time figuring out how do people effectively navigate life filled with ups and downs. And there are externally driven downs and, and ups and there are internally driven ones. And that's what this is all about. And so what we fundamentally believe is life is not hard. It is hard work. And we tend to work hard at our jobs and not very hard at our life or ourselves until and unless something bad happens. And our hope is that these moments uh, are moments of transformation, moments of catalyst, moments of reflection and introspection that allow you to build not just something that sustains you through this, but actually something that propels you forward into uh, even better after this, just like the guys at the Hanoi Hilton, just like Victor Frankl, just like so many of the people who come through our location. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Ashley. Awesome, thank you guys so much. Um, looks like we do have a question um about um the one to five slides so tammy was asking what would you suggest is a good step to go from a one to a five i know you talked about goal setting do you think you could expound on that maybe for a minute or two yeah i mean i think you know let's 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 just take for argument's sake let's take our, our body uh, as an example maybe i'm a one and my goal is to get you know to a five but obviously 
if you go back to my definition of success, we got to do it day by day. And that's, that's, that's the important thing that I want to, you know, uh, focus on here. You're not going to go from a one to a five in, in a week, right? If you join a gym, you're not going to go from one to a five, probably in three weeks, you know, that takes time to get there. So maybe, maybe I'm a one and I'm having a hard time walking up the stairs, but I'm healthy enough that I can walk. So what I decide to do is today I'm going to walk, you know, up, uh, uh, 5,000 steps and tomorrow I'm going to walk 10,000 steps. And by the end of the month, I'm going to be up to, you know, 20,000 steps a day, whatever that might look like for you. And I also think it's important to write these goals down because I think it starts to build this kind of accountability uh, 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 worksheet for you where you can go one at a time, you know, measure your wellness one through five all the way down and figure out on those other charts that we put up here, uh, figure out what it is you can do in each one of these areas. Mm -hmm. if, if you're a one financially and you're, and you're trying to start a savings account, figure out where you can kind of start to relieve some of that financial burden where you may be spending too much money um, uh, and, 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 and try instead of spending that money, putting a little bit away in a, a savings account. You'll be shocked even with 20 bucks a payday, you'll be shocked how fast the savings accounts can add up. And, and one of the things um, from a goal setting perspective, so, you know, we focus on SMART goals as an organization and as individuals. Every single person on our staff, we do wellness checks. We do goal setting for people's personal well-being. And, and a SMART goal means it's specific, it's measurable, it's action-oriented, it's realistic, and it's time-dated. And, and so that means that your body goal wouldn't be, I want to lose 20 pounds, because that's not an action. That's, a, that's an aspiration. It would be, I'm going to go for a walk four times a week. And it may be that we usually set 30 day windows, but it may be that it's just a one week goal right now. My one week mind goal is to read 20 pages every night before bed or to only watch um, you know, TV twice a week. And, and so it can be things you do do or don't do. And your body goal to be to something related to walking financially could be uh, to, to create a budget, right? It could be creating the conditions for the thing you wanna do. And then spiritually it could be, you know, I'm gonna check in on three people that I haven't talked to in six months and I'm gonna reach out to those people. And so the idea is, is like Ken said, create the goal, write it down and then share it with somebody. Because if you can create a world where you're doing this with other people, you have this inbuilt accountability that'll take the likelihood of success from about 25% to about 95%. And, and cause that's when someone's like, Hey, uh, like I do with some of our, our team members, it's like, did you meditate today? Right. And then it gets frustrating, but it's like, they're the ones who told me they wanted to meditate. I'm just the one who's asking a hard question of, uh, did you do what you said that you wanted to do today? I think that's excellent. So then after you have measured yourself, after you've checked in with yourself, I want to talk about what that looks like to check in with other people, especially during so much uncertainty. Can you guys talk about what kind of acts of service we can do right now? This might go along with the spiritual wellness that you talked about too. Well, and I, the other thing I want to, I just want to say, because you just brought something up, I think that's important is that this is a great exercise to do with your, your, your family and your friends too, right? And everybody, mm -hmm. you know, sit down together and, and then kind of keep each other accountable as you, as you kind of set these, set these goals. I think there's a lot that can be done uh, today. I, you know, I think when you start to look at uh, small acts of kindness and, and, you know, just going out and meeting your FedEx driver and thanking him for, you know, for being there. I mean, that's something that just doesn't take a lot. Next time you check out at the grocery store, to thank the young person or the person that's working behind the counter, and you know, for for getting up that morning, you know, because they're probably scared, like 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 a lot of us are, about you know what's going to happen, and are they going to work every day and getting exposed to all of us, and you know, to, to work in a grocery store and make seven or eight dollars an hour. I I don't know. This is these are the things that require us. To, to be kind and to be thankful for, you know, mm -hmm. not your, your your groceries down because the line's too long. Or the other day I had to go to, uh, to Home Depot and, it, and it, it, the line to get into Home Depot because they're only letting so many people in was longer than what I needed to get inside. But there were people <laughs> in line complaining and I kept thinking, well, you're here, you're the one that's at Home Depot, you made this choice. So, but, you know, be careful in, 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 in blaming others for your, your kind of decisions. And I think, that's one of the things that kind of really, I think, in life can, can, can lead to these an an anxious moments is that when we, we don't really kind of blame ourselves. And I, I've got this, this kind of saying that, you know, people in general terms want a lot of responsibility, but they don't necessarily want the accountability. 
And I think accountability starts right here with ourselves. And if we hold ourselves accountable to these decisions that we make, we can't blame anybody else. And I think, you know, this goes like this whole thing really gets into language and how we define things. And obviously like we work with people that, like Ken, who when they say service, it's like, oh, they were willing to die for the country, right? Like you're talking about um, definitions that are very vast and lofty. And we certainly see that with the incredible healthcare workers and the, the first responders who are doing amazing things. To me, the first thing we can do to be of service is to follow the guidance that we're being given is because yes. that's actually mm -hmm. how we prevent other people from getting sick. And, and realize like, there's something to be said for matching action and intention, which is I'm staying home because that's the right thing to do. And it's gonna keep other people safe. Just reminding yourself of that helps you realize that as ridiculous as it sounds, Netflix and chill is probably going to save other people's lives right now, <laughs> as opposed to being like a waste of your time. And, and I think the second yeah. thing is, is check in on people, right? There's a lot of people um, who may live alone, who may be elderly, who may be struggling, just check in because like the idea that we have to give something to people I think isn't necessarily accurate. The idea that what we can do is demonstrate to people that they matter, that they're not invisible, that we see them, that we hear them, and that we care about them, that's a huge uplift for people right now who might be struggling. And so checking in on people and just giving them time and, and, and shooting the bull with them is, is a critical part of that. I think like Ken said, being appreciative to, um, you know, this, it's an interesting world when you start to realize whether you're essential or not. But, but even just asking the guy, like I was at Exxon and Percival, I mean, these guys aren't just having to work. They would get paid more if they, they got shut down, right? So you have people in dire straits who are going home to their families who don't really want to let them in the house. So it's yeah. like, how do you just ask that guy, like, how you doing, man? Like, and by the way, stay away from them. People are giving them cash. They're doing, like, be respectful of the fact that they're on the front lines in a lot of respects. So I think if we tone down our definition, and then if you have extra resources, clearly, Give them to organizations right now that are serving the people who really need help. There are groups that are, you know, giving computers to kids so they can do online learning. There are groups that are providing food, uh, support for healthcare workers, for PPE, all that kind of stuff. I think there's a range of options um, that, that are really, really amazing and don't require us to jeopardize our health or other people's. Yeah, I think that is so great. Um, Probably have time for a couple more questions. Um, I had one for you both. Josh, I loved what you said about being the guardian of your own mind. Um, I think that's really hard to do, especially because our thoughts get a lot louder when we're alone with them. So um, in your book, you talk about embracing your struggle. So I want you to kind of expound a little bit on why people need to embrace their struggle um, maybe that's part of acceptance, but how does that help? And then how do you transfer that struggle into strength? Yeah, um, well, you know, it's interesting. We were having dinner the other night um, at, at Ken's house with Julia, um, and she had me pull up this quote from The Lion King, and um, it was the guy getting bopped on the head. And then the point <laughs> was that you can either learn from your past or you can run from it. And, and I could certainly, I mean, like I struggled mightily. I took an eat, pray, love trip around the world, right? I did everything I could through, through music, right? Never having a moment when I could hear my own voice, right? I always was drowning things out, uh, drinking too much. Like I said, taking a trip around the world. All of these ways that I was trying, I, I moved to New Zealand for God's sake, just literally as far away as you can go and still be in the civilized <laughs> world. And, and the point is, it's still gonna catch up with you. Like it's still going to manifest and, and be there and come out in ways. And what I mean by that, it's like your struggle, right? The ways you think about yourself, the struggle you may have with your own self-worth, the coping mechanisms you've developed over time, that stuff all is with you no matter where you go. And so that, that as Robert Frost said, the paraphrase, right, the only way out is through. And, yes. and part of this is really being able to understand. And that's the whole point of our approach is, is diligently kind, you know, with kindness towards yourself is start to assess and evaluate and peel back the layers of your own onion to understand like, hey, you know, this is my story. We talk in the book and we didn't do it today, but like our childhood shapes a lot of our worldview about ourselves, other people in the world, mm -hmm. and our traumas from our childhood. And for the record, all of us, no matter how great your parents are, this isn't blame parents day, all <laughs> of us have these scars and that's okay. But if we don't understand them, we won't understand how they manifest in the way we're a parent, in the way we're a colleague, in the way we're a boss, and so just understanding ourselves deeply, being self-aware is what this whole thing is about. And 
you don't have to do that on your own. If you want to use a mental health person, you can. If you want to use friends, you can. If you want a life coach, you can. There's lots of resources, I think, to do that. And, and the whole point of like, how do you transform it? You know, part of it starts with understanding it. And, and the reason why the education piece is so important is recognizing that by leaning into the struggle that you'll find value is what most people think is I'm going to white knuckle life and I'm going to get to the end. And as long as I held on tight, right, as long as I kept the, the box of all the crap I don't want to think about, as long as I kept it locked up, I'll be okay. And the truth is, right, and most people don't know this, but Pandora's box, at the end of Pandora letting everything out of the box, what was left in that box was hope, right? So the point is when you actually stop white knuckling it, that if you do let go and start to open up, good things, even better things can be there. So the incentive to do the work is much higher. Our issue with mental health is that as a general rule, the focus is to reduce your symptoms, make you feel less bad. That's not a good enough incentive to talk about really bad stuff. But if I could tell you, you could grow and live a better life and a more authentic life and a more fulfilling life, that's a much better incentive to say, all right, my gloves are off. Like I'm gonna stop white knuckling and I'm gonna let go and I'm gonna figure this out. And that's what kind of this, this roadmap is. And the reason why we feel confident talking about it is, you know, on a general day when we're open, we're working with six to eight combat veterans and first responders who really are struggling so deeply, they don't know if they want to be here. Yeah. And so that's why we're like, anything short of that, if that's you, great, right? But if it's anything short of that, it definitely works. And so that's where all of this comes from is how do we do that when we're struggling mightily? That's so good. And I've got a final question here from Tony Howard. Um, he says, can Ken and Josh advise us where we can find ongoing support for these principles if we decide to implement them in our own lives? Yeah. Hey, th thanks, Tony. Tony. Thanks for your leadership <laughs> in the chamber as well. Um, you know, the, obviously we've got our book up on the screen there, Struggle Well. I think it'll, it'll give you a little more depth about our personal stories kind of woven through um, how, how this framework kind of, you know, manifests uh, in our lives. And then there's uh, three other books up there, or two other books up there that, that I highly recommend is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Um, again, a Holocaust survivor who saw the worst of the worst. You know, all his, his parents died, his wife died. I mean, every hope that he thought he had left in life, but he went on to be a remarkable human and share these kind of uh, stories. Same with the Vietnam uh, uh, prisoners of war, the ones that came home and really, you know, they're, they're living, men, men, I'm talking about men that were shot down and lived in prison camps, not for, you know, a day like modern day terrorists, you know, keep you in for a day and, and, and kill you the next day or maybe two days. Uh, but these men were in camps for six, seven, eight and a half years. We're in an eight by eight cell. And as Charlie Plum said, it wasn't the eight by eight cell, it was the eight inches between his ears that, that was the real prison. And to get out of that kind of, as he would refer to it as prison thing, think about what's good. So there's a great book called Lessons uh, Learned from the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, and we love that book. It gives you another, there's another framework in there about how these men survive. And man for man, when you look at prisoners of war, pilots who were shot down and kept in captivity and starving and beaten and tortured and all the things that go along with being in a prison, no toilet paper for six years. When you look at them compared, and there's a group in Pensacola that does physicals on pilots. They've been doing a study since 1974. When they look at the prisoners of war compared to their, to their peers, folks that weren't shot down, the prisoners of war today are healthier than their peers. So these frameworks work, and these are kind of the worst type of trauma that, that I think humans could endure. So um, I think there's a lot we can do, and it's a great time to listen, but take a look. We have a website too, strugglewell.com. There's a couple of resources on there as well, but uh, grab a copy, uh, grab a copy of the book. And the last thing is, um, we mentioned is the podcast. So if you're on Apple or you're on Google or you go to Spreaker, S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R, um, the podcast is there. And the latest one we did, which was with Charlie Plum, um, if, you, if you need some perspective, like it's, it's exactly what Charlie does. And it's not in a judgmental way, because I think those guys understand that everybody has a mental prison of some kind that we get locked in. And, and actually kind of alluded to it. It's like, we all have the things that end up locked. And what all of these people tell you is the keys in your pocket. The 
key is always in your pocket. It's just a question of, of can you find it, right? Can you look there mm -hmm. and, and clear out the lint and the debris and the bad decisions and all the other stuff that's in there, the receipts of, uh, of things you probably shouldn't have done. So that, that's the whole idea. And so I think, you know, that, that, yeah, podcast awesome. is a good one. Awesome. These are excellent resources, guys. Thank you so much. I kept you over time. So we'll go ahead and end here, but um, please go ahead and check out these resources. Uh, this webinar is gonna be available on YouTube. We're gonna post it on our website in the coming days. And it's also, you can watch it it's on Facebook Live right now. You can go back and watch the replay if you're able to. But thank you, Ken and Josh, again, so much for your time. This has been so informative and, and powerful and uplifting. So I really appreciate it. Thank you for all you do. Thank, thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye, everyone.